This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. Pleasure to welcome you to the fourth session of our mini medical school on the Affordable Care Act. Um, and I think before I introduce our panelists for this evening, just a brief uh, recap of where we've been and a little preview of where we're going. You know, we started off three weeks ago with Dr. Stuart Altman's talk on the history of healthcare reform in the United States. Then two weeks ago, we had our panel with left, right, and center perspectives on healthcare reform, uh, some roads, some of which were taken, at least in part in the ACA, and some not taken. Um, then last week, we kind of dove into the Affordable Care Act and, and did an overview of the major provisions. And then secondly, talked about um, the impact of the Affordable Care Act on two um, groups within the population. Uh, Dr. Alina Salganikov talked to us about impacts on women. Uh, and then we had two of our rheumatologists, uh, Dr. Yazdani uh, and Dr. Lawson, talk with two of their patients uh, about the impact on persons with chronic disease, in this case, two people um, uh, coping with lupus. And, and I think that was, for me, probably the highlight is hearing those two uh, courageous patients share their stories. Um, tonight, we're kind of we're going to kind of step back from that patient perspective and go back kind of to a systems level and try to answer the question: So, how's it going with implementation of the ACA? And I'll introduce our speakers in a minute. Um, today, we'll be really looking at um, the implementation of the major coverage expansions in the ACA and uh, some of the delivery system provisions. So without further ado, let me introduce our panel for this evening. I'm going to introduce them in order, and then they will come up in order to um, give their PowerPoint presentations. Um, just as a reminder, we are taping, so we're going to ask everyone to hold questions to the end. Um, after we finish the PowerPoints, um, we'll um, sit in a semicircle up here and do our question and answer uh, session. Um, so our first speaker is Bonnie Preston, who is an outreach and policy specialist at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services Region 9 office here in San Francisco. Um, the federal uh, Department of Health and Human Services divides the country up into regions, and each region has a regional office. Uh, and so Bonnie has 20 years of experience in health policy, health services research, and program development at all levels of government. Uh, and also in the private sector. Uh, prior to joining HHS, she was an independent consulting, assisting California to prepare for the Affordable Care Act in areas around workforce development and uh, telehealth, uh, and also had an illustrious career in other organizations in Northern California and Washington, D.C. Our second speaker will be Dr. Jeff Rideout, Senior Medical Advisor to Covered California. And Dr. Rideout is, is uh, responsible in this role at Covered California for all clinical quality, network management, and delivery systems reform objectives for Covered California. Um, prior to Covered California, he was the chief medical officer for the Trizetto Group uh, and was also chief medical officer and global leader of healthcare. Uh, for Cisco Systems, Internet Business Solutions Group, and prior to that uh, was Chief Medical Officer and Senior Vice President uh, at Blue Shield of California. He is also concurrently now serving as a faculty member at the Haas School of Business at UC Berkeley. And I should say, Ms. Preston is going to 
give us sort of the national federal perspective on implementation of the ACA across the country. Uh, Dr. Rideout will be talking about Covered California and how well it's achieving its goals here in California, I think pretty well, we might add. Um, then Dr. Andy Beinman, um, who is on our faculty here at UCSF in the Institute for Health Policy Studies uh, in the Department of Medicine and, Epi and Bio, Epidemiology and Biostatistics, is going to talk about implementation of the Medicaid expansion, uh, a little generally, but mostly focused on how things are going here in California. Um, in addition to being faculty member here, uh, Dr. Beinman is the director of the University of California Medicaid Research uh, Institute and the director of UCSF's Primary Care uh, Research Fellowship. And if that wasn't enough to keep him busy, he's a senior advisor in the Office of the Assistant Secretary for Planning and Evaluation within the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Uh, and in 2009, 2010, um, he was a Robert Wood Johnson Health Policy Fellow on the staff of Congressman Henry Waxman and the Energy and Commerce Committee and was one of the chief architects of the House version of the ACA, particularly around the Medicaid provisions. Um, and then last but certainly not least, Dr. Joanne Spetz, who's also on our faculty uh, at UCSF, is going to talk about healthcare workforce and delivery system reform. So that once we've heard out about cover, how coverage expansion is going, she's gonna talk with us about a little more about how things are going with the ACA uh, in terms of workforce and delivery system implications. So Dr. Spetz is a professor at the Institute for Health Policy Studies and the Department of Family and Community Medicine and in uh, social and behavioral sciences in our School of Nursing. Um, she is the Associate Director of Research Strategy for our Center for the Health Professions at UCSF and Director of UCSF's new Health Workforce uh, Research Center. Um, in addition, she's a member of the Institute of Medicine's Standing uh, Committee on Credentialing Research in Nursing and was a consultant to the Institute of Medicine's Committee on the Future of Nursing. Um, so uh, I think we've got a illustrious panel of speakers that um, are gonna give us a lot of helpful information today. And so with that, I'll turn it over to Bonnie. Thank you so much. Um, so I just wanted to, tonight, um, for my point, I wanna just point out different resources that are available um, from the feds and also as, as um, we just, Janet just told you that I'm gonna talk, try and look at how implementation has gone um, nationally of the Affordable Care Act. So let me just click forward. So as Janet said, uh, Health and Human Services has split up the country into nine regions and we're over here in San Francisco and we're, region nine is responsible for Nevada, Arizona, California, Hawaii, and the Pacific Territories um, and the affiliated um, Pacific jurisdictions too. We've got three island nations too that we um, are responsible for. And this, these are three reasons for our being here um, in our office. I'm with the Office of the Regional Director and our office serves as a public interface with federal health programs. We represent regional issues to influence the operation of federal programs. So stakeholders tell us issues that they have with um, initiatives and programs coming out of Washington and we try to then try and gather the information, see which ones have merit and would actually improve the programs and work to represent those issues um, to improve the programs to um, advocating to DC. And finally, we also like to share best practices across the region to improve the programs. So that's what we do. You have in your course looked at why we needed to um, change the current system, so I'm not gonna I'm not gonna rehash this, but I think um, what what has ended up with the Affordable Care Act in terms of what it's really focused on is really the economic impact of um, uninsurance and trying to really save individuals and small businesses who have not been able to afford coverage to save them from financial disaster if when they have a health 
a bad health event. And similarly, looking at the national scale, the federal issues with um, how health care is dragging down our economy had really reached a high pitch in 2010 when the bill was able to hobble through um, both houses of Congress and be signed by the president. So we had the historic signing, and I also was really happy to see that last week um, Janet had made sure that as you went through the Affordable Care Act, you covered all the facets of it. It's, um, it's really focused on three aims, better care, better insurance, and staying healthy, and there are resources in each to support changes to our health system in each of these areas, and I know that that was um, also talked about, but I think too often people just think about the coverage aspects um, and they say, you know, it does nothing to improve our system, which um, you all know now that in fact it does. And we've already started to see changes um, in the health in the healthcare system. So as you learned last week, um, Medicaid expansion is a huge part of this, um, of the Affordable Care Act. It's, it's gonna allow um, millions of people to get coverage and, I, and it'll be great to hear Andy's take on it from being there when it was um, put into the bill. This is where we are. This is a, um, an infographic that the White House put out uh, that talked about where we are with Medicaid expansion in the country. I think we have, huh, now am I going to be able to see it? I think, I think it says like we have 26 states, I believe. Andy, is that right? That um, have adopted it. But states can do this at any time. And even with um, traditional Medicaid, even um, the state of Arizona started Air, um, their Medicaid program in 1984, was it? Around there. So um, states can come in at any time, but it sure would be nice for them to join soon because then, as you learned, the marketplace is really meant to meet up with coverage eligibility with Medicaid to make so that whatever your income is, you can get some help with getting coverage. But um, the, as you can see, we have quite a long way to go to get the whole country to expand their Medicaid program. In our, in our region, California has expanded, all, all of our states have expanded. So. That was really exciting. Arizona was the last one to do it, but after a big fight between the governor and the legislature, Arizona uh, did expand Medicaid. Um, in terms of setting up health insurance marketplaces, this was another kind of surprise with implementation. I believe, and Andy, you'll have to correct me if I'm wrong, I think the thought was when the bill was passed was that um, states were going to want to do this on their own. They were going to want to set up marketplaces and not have the federal government run them for them. But in fact, here we are, the deadline for states to set up or, just, or to say that they were going to set up a marketplace was um, December of 2012. And, and the reason for that was because if the feds needed to know when they, which states they were going to have to set up marketplaces for. So um, they needed to set this deadline, and the deadline was, um, was put off, frankly, for as long as possible. Um, and in December, when they saw how many states were not opting to set up the marketplace, um, they came up with, we came up with this idea of a state partnership model. I mean, they were try we were trying everything to to get states to take this up because the capacity of the federal government, truly, they were thinking they were going to be running federal marketplaces in maybe five states, maybe three, five states. Now we were looking at 21 states to do this in. So, so much for federalism. I mean, that was supposed to be the big push that everyone would want states' rights. They're going to want their own, own marketplace, but that was not the case. So um, the, market, the, the state partnership model was was thought of, and um, that is basically where the states administer some plan management, but the feds come in and do the rest. Um, and the idea would be that in this partnership that the state uh, gets their capacity together and then they're able to run their own marketplace. So we have um, seven states that took up that option. They said, okay, well, if you'll do a lot of the stuff for us, then then we'll play along. So. 
basically we still have so when we thought there'd be a lot more we just have the um, 17 states with state-based seven market um, partnership marketplaces which are really essentially feds running the show so um, that's just a lot more states than it was was anticipated so when we're talking about implementation that was a real biggie <laughs> but also i just wanted to give a little air time to the issues with healthcare.gov um, we all know that it was um, pretty pretty much of a disaster i mean the president and the secretary sebelius has even said that uh, when it came out uh, it just did not have the capacity of the number of people that hit that were wanting to get on but after, over time there's been a lot of work and a lot of uh, management changes uh, to how healthcare.gov has been uh, um, being implemented since uh, since um, November really and now we have um, there's always and there's a lot of more transparency about how healthcare.gov is going. So you can always um, go on healthcare.gov and, and look at the blogs and um, it will tell you the, how, how many hits they're having per day. And right now they're up to um, being able to handle 83,000 people at any one time. And um, the December surge showed that um, 1.8 million people visited can handle up to 1.8 million uh, visits per day. So the capacity has been greatly increased, and it has made for much smoother um, user experience. Now the exp now the um, priority is um, on getting it so that the healthcare.gov information can be transferred more easily to third parties like um, the health plans themselves and in the state-based marketplaces the states so that um, these systems work, work more um, seamlessly together so that's what um, so that's improving and then I just wanted to point out that um, when this happens you have to you know policy changes were made um, because of the issues with the uh, rollout of the online marketplace. They've ha uh, we had to delay the employer shared responsibility requirements. There now are long, we had to extend the transition time that people have on non-ACA compliant plans. We extended the enroll by dates so that people had a longer time if they couldn't get Help, um, enough help to enroll that the, the original the to be qualified for the January 1st start date of your plan you could enroll by December 23rd instead of December 15th and um, they also we also extended the pay by dates so that you could pay your premium later and it would be retroactively um, your your plan would be retroactively effective um, to the, to the January 1st. So, so when you have these bumpy implementation, it, it, you have to make the policy changes, and that's, that's what's happened. So that's how implementation has been going. So I wanted to just show you, there have been a couple different survey re surveys released about how enrollment has been going, how consumers feel about it. One was done by the Commonwealth um, Fund. This one was done by Perry Undum. It was commissioned by Enroll America. And um, the interesting thing here is, um, so they asked, they did a survey of people 18 to 64, which is really the target group for the marketplaces between this time period, December 12th to the 22nd. And they said, um, wanted to see, were people aware of the, of the healthcare, new healthcare marketplaces and um, had they visited the site. But actually, they found out that the technical problems um, with the website hasn't been a big barrier to enrollment so far. And I can, I can give Janet this study um, for, for you to go through, that the real problem with, that people had is um, people still don't know that there's actually financial help available on the marketplace to buy plans. So they found that 
don't know that tax subsidies or financial help are available. So there's still that problem. They still think they can't afford insurance, and that's why they're not going to the, look at the marketplace and see what's available. And then they also, this survey also showed, showed that um, people weren't available that brand new plans, insurance plans were available in their states. Um, on the marketplace. So interesting that a lot of um, attention has been paid to the technical problems of the websites, but in fact, when you ask people in this age group who we're trying to reach out to, they just don't know that there is financial help available and new plans are available in their area. So still a lot of work to do, and that's a huge factor in um, how the implementation has been going. So in terms of what do we know, where are we with what we have achieved? We just passed the four million mark that um, four million on last week, that four million people have now signed up for private health insurance since October 1st. 25% of them are between the ages of 18 and 34, which is uh, an age group that we know is hard to convince that um, that healthcare is affordable and important for them to have, but this is still lags behind the proportion of uninsured who are in that age group, which is 50 percent. So we're so so far we've reached um, the enrollment has been 25 percent in this age group, but 50 percent of the uninsured are actually in that age group. So soon we need that to um, to match up. Interesting, we know that 62 percent of those who have enrolled so far have been choosing the silver plan, which is, as you learned last week, a richer plan. And uh, the, so by, and, by far and above, this is the largest, most of, the largest number of people have been choosing silver, and then only, and 19% using bronze, that's the second most common. And 82% um, of the people who have bought these new plans have received financial assistance on the exchange. Also with Medicaid enrollment through December, 6.3 million people had learned they were eligible for Medicaid or renewed their coverage. So Medicaid enrollment has, is reaching this level, but that's what we know. And also small business, the small business health care tax credit has provided more than a billion dollars in tax credits to help small business owners purchase plans for their enrollees through the um, small business um, health options marketplaces, the shop that I think you learned about last week. We've also seen that people with insurance are getting better insurance. 71 million Americans with private insurance now receive preventive care with no out-of-pocket charges. 8.7 million Americans on the individual market gained access to maternity care. Expanded mental health and substance abuse disorder benefits. Um, ha are now available to 62 million Americans, something that often was carved out of health plan in the past. And 3.1 million young adults under 26 are now covered because of the Affordable Care Act. Community health centers have been expanded and increased their total number of patients served by 3 million due to the um, expansions that were provided under the Affordable Care Act. And then um, in terms of finance, I I've got a I got to get everybody to have more time, but um, I think you might have heard that growth in health care spend, spending is at a historic low, that for the individual, now they're getting more bang for their health care dollar with um, more money of their premium dollar having to be spent on direct medical care versus non-medical expenses, and um, that has meant $1.1 billion has been refunded to nearly 13 million consumers. So that was an average rebate of $151 per household who had insurance. And um, insurance rate review programs that have been implemented across the country to different extents um, have saved an estimated $1 billion uh, as cost to consumers. So I'm going to just... Um, many improvements to Medicare, Medicaid, and I think you know all the rest. So I just want to thank you um, for looking at how we've been doing on the implementation, and I look forward to having a discussion later.
Well, good evening. I'm Jeff Rideout from Covered California, and I want to thank you for inviting us tonight. Um, I've been a little under the weather, so if I collapse, um, I'll have Andy come up and save me. Um, I, one thing I do want to mention is I was a resident here, and I met my wife here, so UCSF has a very special place in my mind and heart. I didn't do the graphics. Uh, they're very nice looking. I guess the way I think about this presentation, um, it focuses on what we were asked to do first, which was market and enroll people in insurance. And I think for the most part, we've been, uh, at least at a high level, very successful at doing that. And I'll share some numbers with you. But I think it's just as important, and most of my time is really spent on what happens next. How do people access care? What did they get when they bought the insurance? What do the networks look like? Um, and really, what are we doing in California, at least on the covered California side, to move what has been a truly Wild West individual market into something a little bit more organized? And you know, the question still is, organized for what? You know, to what end are we pushing this toward? Is it purely affordability? Uh, is it also for quality and uh, network delivery goals? Is it to reduce health disparities? And aspirationally, all of those things are on the plate. Uh, for any of you that have started a small business or a large business, um, going from zero to now over 800,000 enrollees in less than a few months, is, it has its own challenges. So um, no apologies for what we've succeeded in doing, but clearly a lot of work still in front of us. A little bit of background, and I'll, I'll move through these pretty quickly, but uh, these are uh, numbers that come from a number of uh, academic universities here in, the U in California. About 2.6 people, million people qualify for subsidies. Um, most of those um, do not have insurance currently. About 700,000 do. So part of the nuance here is the people that actually were able to buy their own individual insurance needing to buy now through either the exchange or what are called mirror plans. So I don't know if you're getting into the nuts and bolts at that level, but this is about the whole individual market in California changing, not just those that are subsidy eligible. So what happened with mirror plans is that um, all insurers that were going to offer individual products, whether they were purchased through the exchange with a subsidy op opportunity or not, had to offer the same benefits at the same price with the same network. So some plans in California left the state in the individual market, and some of those were the large national carriers. They did not want to um, change their coverage and, and actually provide the better coverage that was required under the ACA. Other plans uh, didn't change much, but made sure they met the coverage definitions of essential benefits. And then still other plans used that as an opportunity to change and oftentimes reduce their networks uh, for all their individual products. So there's a real challenge out there because there were no uh, standard expectations or rules, and different companies chose to do different things. Some left the state, some changed what they did in the individual market, others stayed pretty much the same. And I'll try to highlight that as we go along, but I think the thing you have to remember, and again, no defensiveness or apologies, but this was set up for Covered California to be a distribution channel for an individual market. And uh, the individual market that it is a distribution channel for is already heavily regulated by the state. So a lot of um, I think misconceptions that Covered California itself establishes the networks or establishes the reimbursement rates for physicians and hospitals. None of that is true, and we're statutorily not allowed to do that. So our target uh, was uh, what we called the enhance was to get to about 700,000 people uh, through the first open enrollment period, which ends in March. Uh, and then if we could get to uh, hopefully about a million by the um, end of this calendar year, which would be the end of the second open enrollment period. And if you can keep those numbers kind of in your head, that would be helpful. And then eventually grow to uh, somewhere around 2 million by 2018, remembering that about there's 2.7 million that are subsidy eligible. Um, others, we I just want to point out, uh, also looking to increase the roles of Medi-Cal. The Medi-Cal expansion was also a huge part of what the state of California committed to. Um, and Andy will talk about where Medi-Cal is on that, on that scale. Um, also really important to understand the demographics of the state. I'm sure most of you understand this at some level, but um, this program for uh, Covered California anyway were, was largely for those that were uh, uninsured and needed subsidy. And that actually is the southern half of the state. It mirrors the demographics of the state. It mirrors everything about the state, the ethnicity, the income levels. And as much as I'd love this to be about what uh, San Francisco needs or what Northern California needs, and we don't ignore those, I believe me, um, a lot of this is really about what does LA need, what does Southern California need, what does Riverside need. And at one point fairly early on with the challenges at the federal level, um, it was not too much of a stretch to say, as Los Angeles goes, so goes the whole ACA. 
um, just because there were so many challenges in other states and we were having our own to be sure. But it's very important that the epicenter of this uh, really is about Southern California. No disrespect for us who live here in Northern California. And it's certainly not about Sacramento. I guess that's the other, uh, although it <laughs> feels like that. You can laugh if you want, Ed. Um, there is a beltway in California as well. Um, so this is where we were at the end of the year, uh, which was pretty remarkable because we only had 100,000 enrollees after October. So there was a huge surge, as was mentioned, in December in general, both at the federal exchange and the state exchange. And the reason I put this up there is that the uh, split of 15 to 85 percent is really important because the first couple of months were really about non-subsidized, more than subsidized, and people that already had insurance. So a lot of the people that enrolled quite naturally were those that knew they needed insurance and may have had insurance already, so older, uh, often those with chronic conditions. We're now seeing a different mix of people, and that's really, really good because for those of you that think about insurance, it doesn't work very well if the uninsured um, all uh, have, have chronic illnesses or are older. And as I get older, I think about that every day. But, um, you know, unfortunately, insurance only works if everybody plays. And the more you split the, the pool of insurers, the more you carve it up by different risk groups or different communities or self-insured employers that get to opt out. It really destroys the ratings. and the. The challenge is if you carve it up too much, uh, it's unaffordable for everybody else. So keep that number of about half a million in mind. Um, here's where we've gone just in the last six weeks. So we're, uh, from an enrollment point of view, we're really, really blowing the doors off. We're already well above where we thought we'd be by the end of this first open enrollment. We are hoping to crest toward a million. And I should also say, truth in, in numbers, these are the people that have enrolled, but over 80% from what we can tell have paid their first month's premium as well. So even if you discount this by 15 or 20%, we are still going to be at our most enhanced level of enrollment. Um, now growth in any organization, any phase has its own challenges, and a lot of the uh, pain that you are reading about or hearing about are how do these plans and how do we, quite frankly, manage this level of interest and expectation that comes with it? Because now that we're in February, almost March, people that enrolled want to use their benefits. That's why people get insurance. So and a lot of those benefits are free preventive care. A lot of those benefits are you know, pregnancy coverage they never had before or prescription drug coverage that wasn't available through their insured plan. So a lot of this is, I don't want to call it growing pains because I think that understates uh, what we are really experiencing now and what we will experience later. But this is a, a massive change in this market and a massive change for everybody involved in it, including the physicians and hospitals. A um, few big statistics. I like these slides. I didn't make them, but I, uh, every time I see them, they're, wow, this is kind of Pretty, pretty big, you know. I can get through this slide quickly. Um, basically, a lot of worry about Latino enrollment. Um, we're seeing a big uptick uh, since December in that, but it still is not uh, representative of the state overall. What we're learning, some of the problems were ours. The enrollment form was um, not translated all that well. The um, uh, Latino families do not like to have their family split between Medi-Cal for their children, and maybe Andy will say that. I, I don't want to keep guessing what you're going to say, but um, uh, Latino families in particular want to be in the same level of coverage and the same type of coverage, and that's not allowed through the federal regulations as they were established in the state regulations. Uh, there are issues of um, uh, uh, non-citizen uh, status and what uh, declaring income and other things will do uh, for those families, so it becomes um, more challenging uh, in that uh, ethnic group than almost any other, and they represent a huge proportion of that total I showed you. So a lot of our efforts in the last few weeks have been really around reaching that population more in the way that they want to be reached. Um, demographics, young adults, we're seeing a nice uptick, and now uh, we think we're pretty close to where we'd like to be for the younger demographics, but again, uh, from a risk pool point of view, uh, younger is better, um, and so we have a lot of work to do there too. Um, I'm not going to read all of this, but I, I guess some things people should know. If you think about a concept called actuarial value, which is sort of what's that product worth um, over and above what an individual has to pay out of their own pocket, um, this coverage is good, but it's not as good as Medi-Cal, at least in an actuarial sense. It's not as good as PERS coverage because there is a lot of cost sharing. There are out-of-pocket maximums. There are premium sharing, even when you're subsidized, that are higher or lower depending on the metal level. So uh, there is financial risk. 
um, even with insurance, and I think um, probably most people understand that or are beginning to understand that, but that's an important concept. And if, if you don't remember anything else, choice really, really matters in this world. Uh, the choice of product, the choice of insurer, because never before, and I've been in the business 20 years, I've never seen as much alignment between certain plans and certain providers. So I want to spend a little bit of time on that. I've only got a few minutes, but I think it's important, especially as you um, uh, anticipate the work next week um, that you'll see. So let me give you a, just a quick rundown. This is the San Francisco. Uh, these are actual um, um, rates. This family annual income is $65,000, um, and this is about 250% of poverty, just to give you a range. And remember, we cover, and people can be subsidized from 139 to 400% of poverty. But the differences here are the subsidy, the premium assistant, uh, assistance um, kicks in at different at the what are, it's the uh, second lowest silver, and then um, plans that are more expensive than that um, um, engender a more um, a higher premium contribution from the family. But you can get some idea of the range of the products. Uh, this is in the silver category. If you go to Alameda, it changes pretty dramatically. Uh, gets the choices less. Uh, the contribution is a little bit lower, but the the number of choices people have is less. And then if you go to Los Angeles, you get a lot of choices. Um, so another uh, just strategic fact is that uh, the insurers that, that are participating are really focusing on Southern California because that's where the membership is. And you'll also see the premiums are very, very much less. And that represents a longstanding fact that the cost of care in Northern California is about a third higher than the cost of care in Southern California without any demonstrable differences in quality either. Um, and that's just a structural problem whether Cover California existed or not, and that's reflected in these rates. Finally, um, what happens when you take an individual market that is really largely uh, not, not looked at as a market and try to put it into a standard purchasing block like a PERS or a large purchaser? Well, the first thing you want to do is start looking at quality and a lot of aspects of what you can do in a purchaser block of that size. And we, we are now uh, probably the fourth largest purchaser of health care through Cover California in the, in the state. So the things that we hope to drive um, by having that marketing market power would go to a long list of things like this, and we're well on our way, and these all appear in the model contract. And I was responsible for making sure they got in there. Now I'm responsible for making sure they actually happen, uh, which is very hard. But I'll give you an idea. We do have uh, standard plan ratings for every region. I picked Los Angeles just so you can see. Um, and the unique thing about this is it's the first time that plans of PPO, HMO, or EPO variety are all rated the same way. So you don't have to do some sort of calculus in your head of HMOs are better, so I'm going to discount those stars versus a PPO or whatever else. So this was a huge fight. <laughs> and, uh, but we did get to a point where we at least started the process of saying what, what else can we do in the quality area so people can look at the plans, maybe look at the hospitals, maybe look at the provider groups. Um, a few things on the network. The networks are very, very broad, and anybody that thinks they're not hasn't really dug into the details. The trick here is they're not all broad in every plan. So you can get to 58,000 unique physicians, and I'll stand by this because I, I did the <laughs> work myself, but you have to pick the plan that has that broad access. So if picking a plan based on provider choice is important, there are options, but you have to, you have to choose and you may have to pay more. That's the other thing here. Um, some people want that, some people don't. Two-thirds of the state's ECP hospitals, 360 acute care hospitals. So we can go on and on and with this. It's not about saying that they aren't there, uh, but they're not there in every plan. So I'll give you one example here in San Francisco. If you live in Marin, anybody live in Marin? Nobody? Okay. Okay. Well, you're, lu you're lucky in San Francisco because the network choices are pretty good. But if you live in Marin, um, other than Kaiser, which is a fine choice, you're really choosing between an EPO offered by Blue Shield, a PPO offered by Anthem, and a PPO offered by HealthNet. In both the Anthem and the HealthNet uh, choice, you can come to San Francisco for your care. In the Shield choice, you can't, okay? So if you don't know that difference and you choose a plan based purely on price and the Anthem EPO is cheaper, that's, that's a potential gotcha down the road. Um, and Anthem has chosen to work with the UC system in all the urban markets, so the best way to get to the UC medical group here or in LA or Orange County is to choose the Anthem EPO. But if you want to go to Sutter, or if you want, you have, probably need to choose Shield, and if you want to go to Brown and Tolan, you probably need to choose HealthNet. So those are real differences um, that people 
probably don't understand because they don't really understand an HMO, a PPO. They don't, they're just getting into the game. So a lot of my days are really trying to help doctors and hospitals and enrollees understand that. And this will be the last slide just because I know we're running out of time. But um, this took a lot of work <laughs> to do. But we mapped all of the products that are offered and the networks that are offered. And this is like a big Chinese puzzle because nobody calls the same hospitals and the same doctor groups the same thing. So there's no reference standards in the industry for saying Ronald Reagan Medical Center is the same thing as UCLA Medical Center, but it is. So a lot of work goes into this. But if you look across all the plans, 97% of the hospitals and almost 80% of the medical groups, but you don't get that same coverage in all of the statewide plans. So again, this is just a reflection of uh, choice comes with, with the responsibility of understanding what you're choosing between. It's not all random choice gives you the same same outcome and a lot of people seem to be picking on price. So I will stop there pretty close and I look forward to your questions. Good evening. Real pleasure to be here. And um, I'm not going to pick up the other part of uh, coverage expansion, which is uh, the Medicaid part, or what we call uh, Medi-Cal here in California. So uh, I think as you probably covered last week, uh, Medicaid is uh, the nation's largest public insurance program. And our state, being as large as it is, uh, Medi-Cal is actually the largest state Medicaid program uh, in the country. And the way the funding works for this program is that it's uh, a combined contribution of uh, the state government, the federal government, uh, and in our state, because it's so large, we also count on county governments as well to, to make some contributions. Uh, in 2012-13, it was a $66 billion um, uh, uh, coverage program, which is quite substantial. Uh, this sort of gives you a breakdown of how, in fact, that funding is uh, where, where it comes from. About 57% of it comes from the federal government. Uh, about 31% comes from our state taxes. And, uh, and then another 12% come from uh, uh, local sources, uh, community, uh, county uh, uh, sources, and some other uh, state funds that are not from our uh, general fund. But uh, you can see it's mostly paid for by, by the federal government. Now, the big thing that you probably covered, uh, one of the big things you probably covered last week is that uh, uh, the expansion of insurance coverage under the Affordable Care Act really comes in two uh, bookend pieces. One of it is through the exchange, uh, covered California here in California and the other part comes through the Medicaid program. And uh, really a very substantial change in the Medicaid program is that the Medicaid program, which many people knew as the insurance program for the poor, always had a kind of uh, an if statement. Uh, you could get this insurance if you're poor and if you also happen to have a, a medical uh, problem or fit some other category. Uh, it wasn't enough typically just to be poor. And in particular, uh, the group of low-income individuals who were not eligible for the Medicaid program were childless adults. Adults were covered if they had a a child who lived in poverty and uh, they, they were a parent of, of, of a child, but if they are an adult and did not have a child, they were not typically covered by the Medicaid program. And the Affordable Care Act changed that. So that was a very substantial change in sort of differentiating this sense of a worthy and unworthy poor who could get coverage. Now, basically, if you were below 138% of the federal poverty level and uh, you were a legal resident here, you could get uh, covered by the Medicaid program. It also, as part of the Affordable Care Act, depending on the state and what income levels it's set for uh, low-income parents, uh, it raised the bar of which uh, low-income parents were eligible for the program. So prior to the ACA, you had to be under 100% of the federal poverty level in California to be eligible for Medi-Cal. Now, under the ACA, you're actually covered up to 138% of the federal poverty level in the Medicaid program. And from a state perspective, uh, and this is why I think it's been so kind of wrenching to watch this across the country, the map that uh, Bonnie showed, um, the federal government, uh, to try to entice states to expand their Medicaid programs, said, fine, we will pay 100% of this expansion for these newly eligible groups, the childless uh, uh, adults as well as these higher levels of uh, low-income parents. We'll pay the full amount to cover those individuals. And yes, we will taper down our uh, contribution to that, but it will never get lower than 90%. And so uh, this was a fairly substantial amount of contribution from the federal government. Yet despite this, uh, as you saw, almost half of the states have still not been willing to uh, expand their 
programs that way. Uh, it wasn't written as a law that was intended to give states the option. It was only the Supreme Court decision that ultimately gave the states the option. And as you know, about half the states have not uh, taken up uh, that, that opportunity, although we are still seeing uh, several states uh, showing interest and perhaps uh, will ultimately come on board uh, with time. So what have been the challenges of expanding the Medi-Cal program here in California? And I sometimes like to use sort of the, uh, for anyone who's ever remodeled a house and knows how painful that is, and then anyone who's ever remodeled a house and lived in it and knows how crazy that is, that's sort of what uh, it's like uh, in our Medi-Cal program. Because in fact, a tremendous amount has been going on in the program independent of what's been going on in the Affordable Care Act. Um, the uh, Medi-Cal population is an extremely diverse and complicated uh, patient pop uh, population, and I'll show you a little bit about uh, who they are. And uh, even without the Affordable Care Act and the expansion that comes in the Medicaid program on that basis, there's been a tremendous number of people moving into the Medicaid program uh, for other kinds of reasons, and I'll show you some of the enrollment numbers on that. And then finally, uh, our Medicaid program has really been trying to transform itself, move away from the purely fee-for-service uh, type system and into more of a managed care arrangement. Uh, we had had some involvement in managed care for our low-income uh, parents and children, uh, but uh, that had been mostly in urban areas, and there's been expansion going on of moving those kinds of managed care arrangements into more rural areas of California, as well as expanding it to the uh, disabled population in the Medicaid program. And those kinds of shifts, uh, like as was just discovered by, uh, uh, discussed by Jeff in Covered California, in terms of transitions and change uh, have growing pains associated with it. So there's been a lot going on in the Medi-Cal program. And this slide just shows you uh, some of the, the demographics of who was in the Medicaid program even before we come to expansion. And you can see that it is an extremely uh, uh, ethnically and racially diverse population. A little over half of uh, Medi-Cal beneficiaries are Latino, about 20% are white, 10% Asian Pacific Islanders, 9% black, and 7% uh, in which there's uh, unknown information. Uh, and then also very diverse from the point of view of, of languages, and uh, a little over half uh, do uh, describe themselves as proficient in English, uh, but uh, you can see that about half the population uh, speaks other languages, with, with Spanish being uh, the most common after, after English. And here are those enrollment numbers that I, I referenced. Uh, basically, uh, this is a, about a 10-year period looking back at Medi-Cal enrollment. So this is all the period prior to coming up to the Affordable Care Act, which is being implemented uh, this year in January of 2014. So you can see that for many years, uh, uh, the program from, say, 2003 to 2008, we were running in the ballpark of about 6.5 million Californians in the Medi-Cal program. And then there's a fairly steep rise that begins uh, sort of uh, uh, 2009 to 2012. In particular, we bump up about another million beneficiaries in the Medi-Cal program. And that really reflects what went on with the economy in this country during that time period. So a tremendous number of people lost their jobs, lost their health insurance in association with losing their jobs. And uh, where do they end up? They end up on the safety net, the thing that's supposed to help them. And so the Medi-Cal program grew from being a program of between six and a half or six and three quarter million people being covered. Uh, by the end of uh, 2012, we we're up to 7.6 million uh, Californians on the, on the Medi-Cal program. So then what happened in 2013, we got another uh, jump, and this jump was about another 850,000 uh, individuals. And this was really from moving our CHIP program, or what we call Healthy Families here in California, which is the program that is targeting children who are just above the income level to make them eligible for the Medi-Cal program. Uh, for efficiency purposes, our state made a decision to transfer those children into the Medi-Cal program to try to reduce some of the administrative costs of running two programs and so forth. And so the children that were in the uh, Healthy Families program were transitioned uh, 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 over the last year into the Medi-Cal program so that by the end of 2013, we're up to 8.75 million Californians being covered in the Medi-Cal program. So again, all of this just as background to give you some sense of what was changing even coming into the Affordable Care Act uh, in, in the Medi-Cal program. And the other big moving piece that I referenced is that managed care really was growing fairly uh, dramatically in the state in this period just prior to uh, the Affordable Care Act as well. 
the blue line, the chil children and families, uh, low-income children and their, and their parents, we've been uh, putting those individuals in managed care in Medi-Cal for, for a number of years, really going back to the late 80s and early 90s. Uh, the, the little bit of growth that's gone on there was the expansion into the more rural counties. Uh, most of the uh, managed care has gone on in, in, in urban areas uh, for those individuals. So the, about 70 or now 75 percent of low-income children and their parents in the Medicaid program are actually in managed care plans. Uh, the, the much bigger jump is the red line, the uh, Medi-Cal only SPDs, or uh, these are individuals who have disabilities or are in the Medi-Cal program on that basis. It's primarily adults, but it also does cover uh, some children. And you can see that really in uh, 2012, we had a, a big rise in the number of individuals who were, who were transferred into managed care arrangements. And so this has been, a, again, a big change from individuals who were used to going to different providers in a fee-for-service arrangement under Medi-Cal into a managed care plan. And then uh, the lower line, the sort of green one there, is the final group of Medi-Cal beneficiaries. These are the duly eligible, those covered by both Medicare and uh, the Medi-Cal program. These are typically low-income elderly adults over the age of, of 65. And the state is very rapidly gearing up to uh, transfer uh, a substantial number of those individuals into managed care plans as well. They're going to do it initially in eight counties, um, uh, including some of the largest counties like Los Los Angeles. Uh, but again, the, the whole idea is to really transform the delivery system, which is something we're going to hear a little bit more about from, from Joanne in the, in the last part of, of, of this panel in terms of how California's delivery system is transforming uh, as well. Now, to talk about what's actually gone on to prepare for the Affordable Care Act expansion, uh, our state had a, um, actually really thought about and embraced very early on the idea of expanding uh, the Medicaid program. So unlike states that have either stayed on the sidelines or have really struggled to reach this decision, California very aggressively uh, said that they did want to expand uh, their Medicaid program. And uh, one of the ways that they demonstrated this, uh, I think you saw the timeline earlier from Bonnie that uh, in March of 2010, we passed the Affordable Care Act in Washington. Well, in that same year, something that got a little bit less press but was very significant here in California is that California got a waiver from the federal government to actually start to expand uh, Medicaid or, or to prepare to expand uh, the Medicaid program uh, in uh, the fall of 2010. And what they did was they got permission from the federal government, including some financial uh, relief and administrative relief, to create what's called the Low Income Health uh, Program, or LIP, as it's uh, fondly referred to. This is a county by county enrollment uh, program in what I sort of refer to as Medi-Cal light, so that uh, these programs had to offer benefits that were quite similar to Medi-Cal, targeting the individuals who would ultimately be eligible for Medi-Cal when the ACA implementation in January of 2014 rolled around. And um, here in San Francisco, this, uh, uh, we had a program that uh, predated this, uh, the Healthy San Francisco program that many of you are probably familiar with. Well, a significant part of that program was actually transferred into a LIP program. And the reason to do that is that it actually brought in federal funding that matched the county's support to, in fact, offer these Medi-Cal-type services uh, to uh, childless adults. And what was the advantage of this? Well, A, it started helping those childless adults to be able to start get benefits and services. And secondly, it helped the county to be able to identify who are going to be the people who ultimately are going to get Medi-Cal so that we were ready to help transfer those people onto Medi-Cal come January 1 of, of 2014. So it was both a early benefit opportunity as well as a mechanism to sort of prepare our very large state to make this transformation toward uh, expansion. Um, now let's talk a little bit about what's happened with enrollment in the state. Um, uh, it was really exciting to see the numbers in cal covered California. I think the numbers have also been quite exciting on the Medi-Cal side as well. There are some key things to understand about Medi-Cal which are, are sort of curious when you sort of step back from it and are important to understand, which is that many people who are eligible for Medi-Cal don't necessarily enroll for the program. And why does that happen? Sometimes it's because people don't know that they're eligible for it. Other times people walk around and they are eligible but they feel totally healthy and they're thinking to themselves, why would I be thinking about buying health insurance? A lot of times people don't think about it until they need something like that. 
And so there are ways of trying to project and anticipate um, among those who are eligible how many will actually en enroll. And um, one of the things that will encourage people who are eligible but who are not enrolled to actually enroll are things like the individual mandate that is part of the Affordable Care Act. Because suddenly people will realize, oh, I may be subject to a penalty if I don't enroll in insurance. And this may drive them to, in fact, enroll in opportunities they have to, in fact, get free coverage under a program like Medi-Cal that they otherwise would not have signed up for. Uh, and so uh, it is estimated that there's probably about um, uh, 250 to 500,000 Californians who are out there who are eligible who will now enroll because of the mandate. It's also anticipated, and I think Jeff or Bonnie put this number up, that there's about 1.4 million newly eligible uh, Californians uh, uh, because of the changes of the uh, eligibility rules of childless adults and so forth, who will be eligible to enroll. And it's thought that probably we'll be lucky if we can get 750 to 900,000 of them to actually enroll in the program. Well, as it turns out, because of the steps that have been taken through the LIP program and other ways of really starting to get people activated to go to the websites like Covered California, which will identify, gee, is this person eligible for the marketplace, or are their income levels such that, in fact, they need to be referred to the Medi-Cal program, the state has actually done a pretty good job of very early on getting a large number of individuals enrolled in Medi-Cal. So in January, for example, we saw 650,000 uh, Californians suddenly enrolled in the Medi-Cal program on the basis of, of, of this law change. And so um, uh, this has been a very substantial uptick in the number of people now on Medi-Cal, and we're now up to 9.4 cal uh, million Californians uh, on, on the uh, Medi-Cal rolls. The vast majority of these people who transferred in in January were on these LIP programs, these county-by-county Medi-Cal light programs, uh, who, who transferred over. And they didn't really have to take a lot of active steps to be able to uh, transfer from being in their LIP program in, into Medi-Cal. And uh, just like some of the data that uh, Jeff showed on Covered California, this is what we know early on about the uh, demographics of individuals who've come into the Medi-Cal program through this LIP transition. So it's kind of interesting. It's a bimodal distribution. Uh, it's both, uh, you see sort of a spike of relatively young adults in their early 20s. This is both men and women uh, and those two lines. And then it sort of dips down, as you might expect, among uh, kind of 30-year-olds and so forth who hopefully are getting their insurance either through employment places or, or other kinds of options. And then there's a whole other group sort of in their uh, mid to late 50s uh, who are now becoming eligible for the Medi-Cal program uh, that previously were not able to be covered this way. And this is now the uh, race ethnicity breakdown. And uh, uh, again, you can see it's quite a diverse group. About a little over a third are uh, Hispanic, and uh, about 28% are uh, white, uh, about 16% African American, 10% Asian, and so forth. So there is quite a bit of diversity that's coming into the Medi Cal program uh, as well. Uh, in terms of uh, looking ahead uh, to uh, what I think we need to be paying attention to with regard to um, uh, 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 Medi-Cal here in the state, I think uh, it's a very good early sign in terms of the first month of expanding up the numbers of people coming into the Medi-Cal program. As we would expect, I think Jeff showed in his slide that we're hoping to get a million people covered uh, in, the, in the program uh, this year. We, so we're now already at 650,000 in the first month. But I think there's a big question about how quickly this expansion will continue after we got that large group in through the LIP uh, transition program. Will we still see people actively signing up? In January, there were about 20 or 25,000 people who came in separately from the LIP transition. And so uh, we'll need to see those numbers continue to climb to be able to reach the goal of, of 1 million as expected. Um, I think a really important issue uh, that comes up that sort of parallels some of the things that were talked about in Covered California is whether this covered expansion will actually translate into access to care uh, because of uh, some of the issues that I hope Joanne will go into in terms of some of the challenges we may have of finding enough providers who will uh, be able to meet the increased demand of more people being covered by insurance. 
I think there's a very important issue uh, that as uh, one of the things that needs to be understood uh, emphatically is that when people are going for insurance, they don't decide for themselves whether they go to the marketplace or they go to Medi-Cal. Based on their income level, you're either eligible for Medi-Cal or you're eligible for affordability credits in, in, in covered California. You don't get to choose between those, or you can choose to go to covered California, but if you're eligible for Medi-Cal, you cannot get the affordability credits uh, to help you buy that insurance. Yet, as people's income will change throughout the year, they may move between being eligible for covered California versus Medi-Cal. And that will create what's referred to as churn, and that could create disruptions in a relationship you might have with one doctor when you're in an exchange plan, and whether you then you are eligible for Medi-Cal, and it may not be the same doctor taking Medi-Cal and so forth. And I think that's an important issue that will need to be tracked and to understand how disruptive that is in, in people's lives. And then um, I think we will need to also understand whether those who are uninsured and gain coverage uh, through Medi-Cal, whether they continue to seek their care through some of our safety net providers, like a place like a San Francisco General Hospital. That's both important in terms of uh, those individuals and the kind of care that they get, but it's also that if those individuals leave the safety net, that may have a huge financial impact on those safety net institutions and their ability to take care of the remaining uninsured, who in our state are largely uh, many of the undocumented who aren't eligible for Medi-Cal or uh, coverage in the uh, coverage California. So let me change here, uh, uh, end here. I just want to say that uh, some of the future uh, policy considerations are that um, we're going to need to look into issues about whether we may need to increase uh, Medi-Cal payments to ensure adequate supply of providers to meet the increased demand. Uh, there's going to be an important discussion, I think, coming up about whether we might need a basic uh, health plan to think about dealing with uh, some smoothing between the Medi-Cal program and Covered California to get rid of some of that disruption and churn. And then there are some discussions starting to form around whether we do we also need a parallel exchange for immigrants uh, who are ineligible for Covered California to allow them to be able to, on a statewide basis, be able to purchase health insurance. <laughs> Thanks very much, and I look forward to the discussion. So as Andy was talking, I was thinking, did I put that in my slides? I hope I did everything he wants me to do. Um, we should have coordinated. Our offices are near each other, and we almost never see each other, sadly. Um, so I'm going to talk about the health workforce, which really does relate to that last point, or one of the last points that Dr. Beinman made, which was, how are all these people going to get care, and who are they going to go to? Um, and that, you know, it's like, great, we're making these great strides in enrollment through the marketplace. Um, California's doing so well with that. We're doing really well with our Medicaid expansion. Who are they going to go see? Because that insurance is not tremendously useful if you have health needs and you aren't actually seeing a provider of some sort. So we've already talked about the main um, components. A few things that have not been mentioned yet tonight were that there were also additional funds going to community health centers for services. Um, and there also is this Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation that was brought up a few weeks ago and is another part of the Affordable Care Act. The Affordable Care Act, um, you know, the, that word affordable in there is not supposed to be just about it making health insurance affordable to the individuals. It's also supposed to be about trying to get health care costs overall under control so as a nation our health care budget is more affordable. We spend at least just about twice as much as most other developed countries in the world on health care per capita and as far as I can tell our health outcomes are not twice as good. So we're not getting a lot of value for the dollar there. You know, it's kind of like when, when we owned a Volkswagen and I was looking at an Audi, it cost about $10,000 more to get four circles on the front instead of one circle. And it was about four inches longer for the station wagon. That was it. And I was like, is that really worth that price differential? You know, some people think it is, but you got to decide what the product differentiation you want there is. So these Medicare innovations in the community health center pieces are important. I'm going to talk about those a little bit when talking about the workforce piece. In the big picture in the Affordable Care Act, there is very little that is actually labeled workforce. Um, there are some incentives to expand the number of primary care physicians, nurses, and physician assistants, um, loan forgiveness programs, scholarship programs, and such directly for people who are debating what field of medicine or nurse practitioner field they might go into. Um, there are higher payments for rural health providers to try to get rural health providers um, more numerous, and, and that's been referred to in terms of Medicaid expansion. How do we make sure that rural 
referral needs are met. Um, higher payments, possibly, for primary care doctors. Um, uh, the higher payments for primary care doctors are going through. Whether it's enough remains to be seen. And then there is a National Health Workforce Commission that has been appointed. Um, and I'll talk about that in a minute. So even though there are these few provisions that directly mention the health workforce and provide funding for health workforce, just about the entire thing is going to impact the health workforce. Um, we're going to have first increasing numbers of people with health insurance, whether it's Medi-Cal, private, you know, some people just from the individual mandate may be spurred to go on ehealthinsurance.com and go buy it themselves because they think, well, I can't get a subsidy, but there is this mandate. Maybe it's a good time for me to go do this finally. And so there may be spillover effects on the insurance outside of the two specific components we've talked about tonight. Um, the funds to community health centers are likely to affect the workforce in that these community health centers are going to have to hire people to do the work that they do. Offering free preventive care for individuals, which can be provided not just by a physician but also by other care providers, should have broad impacts on the workforce demand. Um, states can offer home community-based services to disabled people, which we're expecting to have a big impact on the demand for personal care assistance and home health assistance. There's a community care transition program for seniors that should have similar effects. There's this whole value-based purchasing program um, that I have some specific discussion about, as well as bundled payment programs, and then these integrated health systems, which are all part of the Medicare Medicaid innovation, and these are really interesting programs. So the health insurance, just straight out, how many extra people are going to get health insurance? Well, in the U.S., it could be up to 46 million. Now, we know that not all 46 million are probably going to get insurance. Some won't be eligible. Some won't bother to fill out the forms. Some will get confused. We, you know, so there will be some numbers smaller than that, but we know there's going to be a big increase in the number of people insured. Um, and people with insurance demand more health care. It's, it, there's a whole variety of research that pretty clearly points to if you have health insurance, you seek more care. In Massachusetts, which did do their own health reform that looked an awful lot like most of the Affordable Care Act, what they found is that there was widespread shortages of primary care providers. People were finding it very difficult to find a primary care provider, and there was a drop in the share of family medicine doctor's offices that were accepting new patients. Um, that was also true for internal medicine as well. So people found it hard to get primary care after the Massachusetts plan expanded the insurance there. So in Oregon, um, which has been doing a really interesting health insurance experiment, they found that there was actually an increase in emergency department visits in the year following enrollment, which is kind of not what you hope would happen. In theory, you get people health insurance, you get them preventive care, and then they don't go to the emergency department because they have a primary care provider. What may have happened is you've got people who couldn't find a primary care provider, so they end up in the emergency room, and they feel like there's less cost to them for doing that because they now have insurance to pay for the emergency department visit. Certainly, if you think going to the ER is going to cost you $1,000 versus it's just going to cost you a copay, you're more likely to even go to the emergency department. Conversely, in a study in California of the healthcare coverage initiative, that found a decrease in emergency department visits. So there's a little bit of a wild card here about how this is going to impact settings of care. There has been some research done on job growth projections. Um, this is some work that I did with my colleague, Bianca Frogner, who's at George Washington University. And we were working from another colleague's, um, actually one of the speakers from a couple weeks ago, Steve Parente, who has a micro simulation model to try to estimate what health insurance plans people will choose. He added to that some analysis of, if you choose, say, a silver plan, how many doctor's visits a year will you do on average? How many hospital days will you have? And, and these other utilization services. And Bianca and I said, hey, Steve, can we have those estimates? Because we want to then go to Bureau of Labor Statistics data and look at what that all implies for workforce. And these are our results here. So the first column is the overall percentage growth that's estimated by the Bureau of Labor Statistics for over the next decade. And their estimates account for the Affordable Care Act, but they don't break out how much of that growth is going to be Affordable Care Act versus just population change. Then we took the work that we did building off of Steve's estimates and tried to estimate the percentage growth that was due to the Affordable Care Act. So for offices of practitioners, and this would include physicians, nurse-led clinics, um, it also would include chiropractors and, and other practitioners, about one-third of the growth in demand for services is probably going to be driven by the Affordable Care Act. 
Now, what's important there is two thirds of that growth is not driven by the Affordable Care Act. That was growth that was happening already because our U.S. population is growing, it's aging, and healthcare needs are rising. You know, obesity epidemic, diabetes, and all of that other stuff. So even if the Affordable Care Act disappeared tomorrow we still have this workforce thing to deal with. We still have this projected growth and demand for workers. Um, home health was, it was projected by the Bureau of Labor Statistics to go up over 80%. And from what we could tell, the strict insurance coverage provisions of the Affordable Care Act hardly have any impact on that at all. But there are other components of the Affordable Care Act that will. So these are some of the largest occupations. Um, again, to give you a little bit of perspective of what that growth would be, um, these are estimates that we did specifically for California. So, um, so at some point, Bianca and I were working um, with a consortium of people, including some of the people that Andy works with at UCLA, and said, um, you know, hey, Steve, can you do this again for California and calibrate the models at UCLA against yours? And then give that to us, and we'll go back to the Bureau of Labor Statistics and do our, our magic with the workforce numbers again. And this is what we came up for California. And um, as you can see, the big growth is really in the personal care aides and the home health aides, that these lower skilled entry level jobs are going to have tremendous growth over the next decade. But a lot of higher skilled jobs as well, physical therapists, dental hygienists, emergency medical technicians and paramedics. I mean, so there are a lot of occupations with big growth coming. To put that for California in the context of what the um, non-Affordable Care Act growth is versus Affordable Care Act, again, that non-ACA growth is a huge chunk of this, which is the growth of our California population and the aging of our population for the most part. So what does all that projected growth mean with respect to do we have shortages or will we have shortages? So the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics does, estimate it, does estimates to determine what regions of the country, and these are generally county-based definitions, but not strictly county-based, have shortages of health professionals. Um, and they have um, different kind of colors in terms of whether the whole county is a shortage area, which would be the red. Um, if it's partial county, it's kind of that, a darker gold. And then um, no shortage is green. So let's begin with how little is green, right? Very little of green. Like California, the Bay Area, we're green. Sacramento's green. But this whole story is not about Sacramento. And it's not really about the Bay Area. So what's um, red? I believe that that's Butte County up there or something like that, north of Sacramento. Um, Sutter County, one of those. But like the rest of California basically has spotty shortages. And some, some places it's the urban areas, you know, deep center city. In other places like the Central Valley where I grew up, you have a good infrastructure in Fresno, a good infrastructure in Bakersfield. You'd think those cities aren't that far apart from each other, but when you're driving 150 or, you know, 100 miles in Thule fog, 20 miles makes a big difference. And so you get shortages all over the Central Valley, all over the rural parts of California. Nevada's one giant shortage. Um, so these are, you know, we already have significant shortages going on um, in Region 9 and across the entire United States. If more people are seeking health insurance or have health insurance and then are seeking providers, this is a problem. And there is, I think, a lot of correlation between these shortage areas and where the coverage expansions are occurring, right? Where people are eligible. So Southern California, um, you know, some of these various states, and also some of these are states that are not doing Medicaid expansions and that are probably going to have issues with coverage to begin with. Then you add the workforce shortage. So one answer to that is that chart was about physicians. But you know, physicians aren't the only ones that can provide healthcare services. And that is um, one of the important things that the Affordable Care Act recognizes. Preventive care can be provided under the Affordable Care Act for full reimbursement by nurse practitioners, physician assistants, and RNs. And if you look at the education and the scope of practice of those health professionals, that absolutely makes sense. There's a lot of preventive care that can be delivered by a whole variety of people in a good care team. So the law does recognize this. They offer the full Medicare payments to any provider of preventative care services. There are specific grants that go to support nurse managed health centers, a couple of which are affiliated with the UCSF nursing school, including Glide Health Services, which is a fabulous health, health services center in the Tenderloin. 
Um, there are also specific funds going into health promotion and public health. So these are grants to promote positive health behaviors using community health workers who have a whole variety of different kinds of training <laughs> approaches. Um, that's one of the community health workers is one of those job titles where it often feels like let a thousand flowers bloom and we'll see what works. Because you can use a lot of different training approaches to try to deliver the idea. We want people who live in a community and know the community to help deliver the services that that community needs, whether it's education, whether it's helping to point a patient to the right kind of provider for them or get them to a screening opportunity at a senior center. Those kinds of workers can play a really big role and there's money to help them do it. Um, and then the home and community based services are likely to have a huge impact on the demand for registered nurses who tend to coordinate a lot of those services, as well as the certified nursing assistants and personal care assistants who are engaged in the direct delivery on a day in and day out basis. And then there was the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation that I referred to that um, I think is fascinating. This is where a lot of the affordability piece in the big picture is probably going to come from. And what they are doing is developing and testing new models of delivery and payment. And because they are Medicare, if they decide that a new model is working and they're going to change their payment structures for it, private insurers have a tendency to follow. So they are very influential in how payment models evolve in this country. So they are doing accountable care organizations. And in those, a group of um, generally physicians groups and hospitals agree that they will take full accountability financially for all the care needs of a population. And if they are able to care for that population, meeting certain quality benchmarks and save a little bit of money doing it, they get to split the cost savings with Medicare. So there's essentially a profit motive going on there. Um, there are bundled payments for care improvement. Um, which are kind of a similar idea. We have a patient coming in for a hospitalization. It's a kind of problem where you often end up with a patient rehospitalized. We're going to give you a bundle of money. If you end up with a patient rehospitalized because you didn't do good post acute care, you're, you're going to eat the difference. You're going to eat that loss. So there's an incentive then to be more efficient. Um, primary care transformation models, there are initiatives focused on Medicaid and the um, Children's Health Program. So there are all these different programs trying to get a sense of how can we improve care, quality, and control our costs all at the same time. They call that the triple aim. So um, the bundled payments we've talked about a little bit in accountable care organizations, there are also, also these innovation awards of a billion dollars that are projects from delivery systems, educators, and advocates, and they have evaluation requirements as well. So an example of that that UCSF is involved in is the care team integration of the home-based workforce. Um, the California Long-Term Education Center, which it has multiple education, insurance, and care partners, um, and the evaluator is the UCSF Center for the Health Professions, are focusing on Medicaid personal care service beneficiaries, which some, in California we call them the in-home support services beneficiaries. Um, so they're going to train 6,900 personal care assistants. So that's a huge amount of training that they're doing, 6,900 PCAs to do health monitoring, coaching, navigating, and care. And um, their goal and their estimates are based on legitimate data. They didn't just pull this out of a hat. They really do believe that they should be able to reduce emergency room visits and hospital admissions by about 23% with this program over a three-year period and redu reduce nursing home stay lengths. And if they are successful in this, that 11 or almost $12 million investment from CMS is going to result in nearly a $25 million savings. So you know what, even if they miss by half, they're still going to save a lot of money. Um, and it is a hugely ambitious program, but a great collaboration of people engaged in making sure it works. So these are the kinds of things that CMMI is investing in. And these things could, in the big picture, really change the way we organize our workforce and the way we deliver care, which we have to do. We just don't have enough workers. We have so many people needing services. And we spend so much money to see relatively little for that extra spending. So our efficiency needs are tremendous. And there's a lot of opportunity here to figure out what works. Oh, one last slide. I did promise I'd mention the National Health Workforce Commission. And I have a colleague who has a slide of their first meeting, which is an MD conference table. They were um, appointed. The chair is uh, Professor Vanderbilt. They were never funded. They have never met. There is a National Center for Health Workforce Analysis charged to collect and analyze data. And basically, until this year, they have been running on a shoestring. So our ability nationally to understand 
what our workforce needs are and how to really meet them has been ridiculously limited. We have almost no coordination of this. Fortunately, the National Center did get a funding increase for this year, so there's some hope. But, um, but yeah, someday hopefully we'll get a full conference table for this National Health Workforce Commission. Thank you. Okay, um, well now we'll shift to our question and answers and um, since I, we're running behind, I'm not gonna take the prayer, chair's prerogative to, answer, to ask the opening question. Um, I'd see it, do we have someone with his hand up already? Okay, well then let's sir take your question and, and then go from there. So this is a triple aim question. <laughs> okay, well I think maybe um, the first part um, which was really having to do with how, you know, what is the impact of the penalties in the ACA associated with the individual mandate, particularly on low-income people. Um, then a question about, uh, Kai you know, about Kaiser staffing and whether we'd in fact actually have shortages if we all were in Kaiser. And then lastly, important question about Medi-Cal fees. Andy, I think I want to give you the, the penalty and the Medi-Cal fees and then maybe toss it back to Joanne to talk about Kaiser and staffing. Or Bonnie, if you want to jump well, in too. Well, we, we were just, the, um, the penalty, if you don't pay taxes, you don't come into the penalty. So if your income's too low. So no incentive, basically. For them to get onto Medicaid. Medicaid. Well, I mean, there's still an incentive. You get health insurance, so yeah, I, I, I would. I, yeah, but but in terms of if you feel well and and, and you're not going to have the penalty, yeah. So the, the the law does basically provide a mechanism whereby there won't be penalty on the lowest income individuals, or if you can't find a uh, a product that is affordable in your area. So there are some exceptions to the mandate that that may come into play. Given I have the microphone, I'll also answer your question about uh, Medicaid payment rates. So. Medicaid payment rates have been studied uh, across the, uh, the, the states. Uh, our state uh, is among the very lowest paying uh, when you put it against the standard of what's the payment rate for the Medicare program. The typical way of characterizing whether the rates are high or low or, or, or correct is saying, gee, maybe the Medicare rates are about right. And the Medicare rates, I should say, are on average uh, about uh, uh, a little over 10% lower than what a lot of commercial insurance is. Depends on the, the kind of coverage, uh, the kind of um, uh, commercial insurance you have and what part of the country you're in and so forth. But Medicaid rates in our state are probably closer to about 60% of what Medicare payment rates are. And as a result, uh, we do find that a substantial number of physicians do not participate in the program. There's nothing by law that requires a physician to participate in, in the Medicaid program, and many uh, choose not to. However, uh, our state does use, a, uh, we do have a very robust uh, clinic system uh, where a lot of uh, Medicaid patients get uh, uh, care. Uh, but the payment rates are an important issue. If we want to bring uh, more providers into uh, participating in the program, that payment probably is an important part of it. Uh, people touched on tonight that the Affordable Care Act does offer a payment bump for 2013 and 14 to get more primary care physicians more money and hopefully entice them uh, to come into the program. There have been some challenges of rolling out that program. It got started late in our state. Uh, and because the program is uh, slated to end at the end of this year, some providers have said, well, why should I get into the Medicaid game only if the rates are gonna cut back uh, afterwards? We just have learned that in the president's proposed budget uh, that he has proposed to extend this primary care payment bump uh, through 2015 as well. That doesn't mean that the Congress necessarily agrees with him, as you know, uh, but uh, I think we are seeing some activity in Washington to again provide federal funds to states to at least try to keep primary care payment rates in the Medicaid program up to try to, uh, to meet the demand that will come with the expansion of Medicaid. Well, a good question on whether we actually have a shortage of physicians at all. And there are two pieces, or I'll say three pieces to that. One is, are, um, are there other care providers who can be doing the work as well? Um, you know, so that you really are working more of a team model, which would be more of the Kaiser approach. Um, and a lot of community health centers and a lot of innovative pri private groups work this way, where it really is a team effort. 
And so you can spread the work in such a way to reduce the load on physicians. And so your physicians are really more efficiently used. The other piece is that we probably have some amount of overutilization of health services, and Kaiser tackles this better than a lot of the others. But, um, you know, if, if your kid had a totally uncomplicated wrist break because they fell down on the playground, you don't necessarily need an x-ray after you take off the cast. If you take off the cast and it looks weird, then you should get an x-ray, but you don't necessarily need another x-ray. You don't necessarily need to see the physician again. A physician assistant could probably take a look or a nurse. And so those are places where we are probably overutilizing services and there are probably a lot of little pieces like that. If you added them up, you could reduce the workforce numbers. Third component is just distribution. Bay Area, we have lots of physicians. Um, Modoc County, not many. A couple additional comments on the distribution in particular. Um, it, it's absolutely right, and what we've seen in Covered California is a lot of the systems like Kaiser are available, but not in the whole rating region. Um, and that goes to a lot of the discussion about integrated care models. Um, Kaiser, as an example, has a fantastic integrated care model, great use of mid-levels, great use of telemedicine, electronic records, everything else but it's very difficult to expand that to the entire state. And so the irony in some of this with Covered California is um, on the payment side, um, most of the plans, but not all of them, are a good bump above Medi-Cal rates. Some are at commercial rates. Um, but that in and of itself will create some challenges for the workforce and where they, they want to participate because if they see it as an extension of a Medi-Cal program, a lot of physicians don't want to be part of that. Um, and the other thing is a lot of the integrated care models that we already have in California, whether they're large capitated groups, um, bundled payment programs, uh, they're not being offered as part of the exchange networks. Um, so even though a plan may have those programs, they're doing more direct contracting with the physicians. So we're kind of in some ways going back to a less integrated model um, with some of the networks, not all of them, but, but many of them. So it's an interesting kind of phenomenon. Okay, so the real question is, given the concerns about workforce, how can we in the U.S. provide affordable education for physicians and other health professionals? And Jeff looks uh, ready to tackle this. I'm not an expert in this at all, but I think we, we first have to really look at the licensing laws and what we do or don't allow um, practitioners to do in, in the name of protecting patients. Um, I've worked with nurse practitioners all my life, and they are some of the most competent, most well-educated. So it's just a, it's a matter of an attitude toward what's appropriate and where do people practice best at the top of their license. And then the only thing I can say about the workforce in general is it takes a long time, but it takes programs like, I don't know if you're familiar with the new medical school at UC Riverside. Um, I'm just getting familiar with it, but the I think it's a, up to a third or a half of the class have to agree to practice in that area where there's a primary care physician shortage or they don't get the uh, medical school paid for. But those are gigantic infrastructure commitments that don't happen easily. Yeah, we have been fortunate on the nursing side. We had a severe nursing shortage that we went into in the late 1990s that basically dragged on till about 2008. And as that became more and more alarming and hospitals were looking at double digit price increases for, you know, for wages, um, everybody got a little bit freaked out because we also knew that the baby boomer nurses were all going to retire, so it could get worse. California, over a 10-year period, more than doubled the number of people graduating from our nursing schools, and most of those graduates are from public programs, community colleges, and Cal State. It was an investment in resources. It was a lot, lot of deans and directors working overtime and late hours making it happen. And right now, all of the forecasts that we do for the RN workforce, we're actually okay in California. We, we do not face a shortage. So speaking to his point, a lot of those RNs are totally well poised to become a nurse practitioner within two years. And they can provide excellent care. And they're also, if they've been working as an RN, they have some clinical knowledge to bring to the table with that as well. So, um, you know, but California's scope of practice um, does have some restrictions. Um, we, are one of, we aren't one of the most restrictive states, but we're somewhere in the middle, whereas our neighbor Nevada just granted NPs full independence.